Okay, this video will talk through Out Out by Robert Frost. This is in preparation for your Edexcel IGCSE English Language Exam, Paper 2. It will be question 1, so it will be in section A um, of Paper 2. I've just realised I'm in the wrong... Uh, yes, I am. Sorry, I'm in my PowerPoint, I need my PDF, just bear with me. And then we'll get started. There we go, that's much better. Um, okay, so straight away, just to give some background uh, for Robert Frost, I don't like to talk too much about context because uh, for this question, if you look at the mark scheme, there isn't anything, um, any marks awarded for context, but knowing the context can help you understand the poem and the intentions of the poet. Um, so Robert Frost heard about this story of a boy who was horribly injured um, while working with some heavy machinery and died very suddenly and so he wrote a poem about it. Um, so that's his inspiration, so keep that in mind. Looking at the title, Out Out, this is an allusion to Shakespeare's Macbeth and this is when, sorry for the spoiler if you've never uh, watched uh, Macbeth, but this is when Macbeth's wife commits suicide and he says, Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And I would argue there's two elements of this famous quote. First of all, Shakespeare here is trying to highlight... Um, the fragility of life, how quickly life can go, just how you can blow out a candle, um, so can life come to an end with as much ease. So I'd say that's the first part of that quote. The other part of that quote um, is really talking about, quest or, or questioning rather, the point in life. So especially the last bit here, it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So it's this idea that when we're alive, we think it's our lives are meaningful and we think it's full of all these wonderful things or important things. And actually it signifies nothing, um, which is rather depressing. But it is calling into question, what is the point in life? What is the significance of it? Um and I would argue that Robert Frost, in choosing this title, in alluding to Shakespeare's Macbeth, that is what he's trying to highlight in this poem. And of course, like I always say, um, everything is up for interpretation. That's the wonderful thing um, about poetry. So these are some of my interpretations. I haven't written everything down because there just isn't enough space. But I've tried to highlight the things that I think would be of most important uh, in, mo of most importance to you in the exam. Um, okay, so the buzz saw snarled and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stove length sticks of wood, sweet scented stuff when the breeze drew across it. Um, so we've got a few things here. It starts with sibilance. It's describing this buzz saw. And I would argue that the sibilance creates this sinister tone um, in reference to the buzz saw. And that's really important. As you know, later on in this poem, it is the buzz saw that um, basically chops off the poor boy's hand, or at least um, severely injures it. Um, so in immediately we have this sinister tone that we connect with this piece of machinery. Uh, furthermore, the use of onomatopoeia and zoomorphism. Zoomorphism is um, when you describe something that's inanimate like it's an animal. And here it's been described as this aggressive, predatory animal. Okay, It snarls, um, maybe like a dog, and it rattles, you might argue, like a snake. Um, so it really draws attention to this piece of machinery. We should be encouraged as the reader to feel quite unsettled by this piece of machinery. And it certainly foreshadows what will come. And that is that this machinery is actually going to be the cause of the boy's death. Um, I would go a little bit further and we'll talk about this a little later. Um, and this links to the kind of the fragility of life. You might see the piece of machinery as a metaphor uh, for 
death kind of lurking in the background. And again, life is so easily lost to different incidents, um, tragic incidents in life. Is this Robert Frost kind of reminding us that um, just like this piece of machinery, death is kind of this predatory animal waiting to pounce at any moment. So it really makes us feel vulnerable. So not just the boy, but maybe us as readers who start reflecting on the fragility of life. And we'll keep coming back to that argument, but that's something that I personally um, take from, from this poem. Um, also note that um, active verbs are used throughout the poem to describe the actions of the machine. And that makes the machine, again, seem more lifelike. It seems much more in control. Um, and I think that helps make the boy seem even more vulnerable. Um, he's not in control of this machinery, although actually he is. He's the one that's operating it. But it makes it seem like the machine is this kind of sinister entity that's um, taking, that does take control of this boy's life. Um, you might argue again, I keep, sorry, going off on, on one with, with different interpretations, but it's important to mention it now because I'll link to it later. I wonder if this is how we handle death especially accidents that can be difficult to handle. So is it easier for his loved ones to look at that piece of machinery as this vicious animal that took away their loved one's life? And would we, um, in a similar respect, think about the death of a loved one in that way? Is it easier to look at it in that way rather than to look at the boy as simply making a mistake? In the end, actually, it's the boy's mistake, isn't it? Um, because he's not concentrating on where his hand is. Um, he feeds his hand to the machine. The machine doesn't take it. Um, so is this just a way that we handle death? That we is it, it is it easier to blame it on the machine rather than to accept that this is a horrible, tragic accident? Uh, and we'll move on. So it's interesting if we think now about the setting. Um, oh, sorry, before that, talk about the sweet scented stuff. I think that just helps. The sibilance there slows the pace. Um, I would argue this is kind of part of the setting. Um, it's really representing the slow pace of rural life, maybe kind of how mundane it is as well. And we see that again, this kind of tranquil setting with the five mountain ranges, one behind the other, under the sunset far into Vermont. Sounds beautiful, very tranquil, and it juxtaposes with the aggressiveness of the buzzsaw. Um, so I would argue that the setting really serves to just emphasize and accentuate the uh, viciousness of this piece of machinery and make us feel even more unsettled about it. Um, and then we have this repetition and the saw snarled and rattled, snarled and rattled as it ran light or had to bear a load. Um, the repetition, again, it's foreshadowing, it's, uh, it's reminding us of this lurking death. Um, but you might also argue that this also shows kind of um, how monotonous this life is as well, the, the work of the boy, it's over and over the same thing day in, day out. So you could also link it to kind of how boring um, life is, you might argue, um, in this setting. And that's supported with this next line, and nothing happened, day was all but done. So that mundane life is really represented in the kind of simple language, um, the short clauses, uh, and really, it's leading the reader into a false sense of security. So you might argue maybe kind of the re repetitiveness of our lives can lead us into a false sense of security. Um, and we just expect the same thing to happen every day as it has previously. And obviously, we know that's not going to happen for this boy by the end of the poem. Call it a day, I wish they might have said, to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. Um, so there's interesting here, because in, initially it's a detached narrator, it's th written in third person, but there is a break from that, uh, from that detached narrator style, when um, Frost says, I wish they might have said, I really wish at this point they had just stopped working. So we've got this really regretful tone, 
And you might argue that break from that detached narrator highlights how tragic it is that Frost felt compelled to comment at this point. Um, and it just kind of um, emphasises the sadness of this situation. Um, also note that the boy is referred to as boy um, repeatedly throughout. That emphasises his innocence. You might argue that you know, that juxtaposes with the aggressiveness of the machinery, um, the harshness of the working life. We wouldn't expect, especially a modern reader, to see a boy in that kind of setting. So that encourages us to feel sympathetic. Um, I'm sure I was going to say something else and I've forgotten it. So I'll move on. Maybe if I remember it, I'll come back. Um, but certainly we're encouraged to feel sorry for the boy and see him as vulnerable in this setting. It's also a very traditional setting. He's a young boy. He's working. His sister is cooking. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them supper. At the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leaped out at the boy's hand or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. So a few things here. First of all, I have, um, this isn't my own interpretation. I read a really interesting interpretation of supper here having religious connotations. Um, of the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. And so is this again um, foreshadowing the end of the boy? So I found that really interesting and an original reading that I haven't seen before and something I hadn't thought of myself. Um, interestingly, we still see this machinery being presented as if it is an animal uh, of a, uh, with its own free will as it leaps out apparently at the boy's hand. And then we see Frost kind of change that or seem to leap and then finally he must have given the hand. So you might argue that in all of this, uh, Frost is the voice of reason as um, this machinery has been viewed as this vicious, horrible, animal, evil thing that's set out to kill this boy. He's the voice of reason that says he must have given the hand. It was not that the machine attacked him. He made a mistake. And this just maybe indicates that that the loved ones around him um, are struggling to accept that, that it's the boy's fault. Um, I've just remembered what I wanted to say about boy. Um, repeatedly being referred to as boy and not giving the boy a name, you might argue, well, two things really. Uh, one um, is maybe keeping the boy anonymous suggests that this happens in many settings across the United States, not just... Um, not just in this particular case. So this isn't a one-off. Unfortunately, these tragic happens, um, tragic things happen all the time. Um, we'll come back to this idea, but actually, is it about referring to the or suggesting that the boy is insignificant, like we all are? At the end of the poem, I would argue, we're encouraged to reflect on the insignificance of an in individual. Um, so is is that reflected in the language here? The kind of anonymity of this boy. However, it was neither refused the meeting, but the hand. So we've got here this exclamation, um, which highlights the horror. I would argue this there's an, a euphemism here because we don't hear in detail what actually happens to the hand. And you could argue that makes it seem even more horrific that Robert Frost can't come to even describe it. You could even go as far to argue that he describes um, the buzzsaw in detail. He describes the setting in detail. He creates a beautiful atmosphere here, the sweet scented stuff. And then he's really so simplistic here, but the hand, it's like he's lost for words. So we can sense here um, the sadness of Frost as well, even in hearing this story and thinking about what happened to this poor boy. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh. So we've got an oxymoron there because rueful is kind of regretful um, or like being bitter. Um, so there's a sense of confusion. You can imagine he cannot believe his eyes when he sees what has happened. This, you know, he's done this day in, day out. He cannot believe this has happened, how quickly things have changed for him. So this is a real moment of confusion for him. Hence why we have the oxymoron. As he swung toward them, holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. So I think this is just such a sad image of him, especially half in appeal. Just this helplessness of this boy 
makes me really sad for him. Um, and the use of the the word spilling, there's a lack of control again that this boy has. He's never really had control, has he, in this situation? And but also spilling um, indicates the speed that he's losing his life. It's not dripping, it's spilling. And so that creates this sense of urgency, you might argue. Then the boy saw all. Look at the monosyllabic words here. There's a bluntness in this tone all of a sudden. It's like at this point, what does he see? Does he just see the terror, the horrific image of his hand severed by this machine? Or does he see more? Is it metaphorical? Does he see the reality of life suddenly he's opened up to the harshness of life and how quickly you can lose it even if you're a boy um, life or death you might argue is a cruel thing uh, so here this is this moment of him losing his innocence really you might argue um, since he was old enough to know big boy doing a man's work though a child at heart so look at the diction here the contrast of boy and child to man so we're really encouraged here to sympathize with him this is we're being reminded that this is a horrific accident that's happening to a young boy and again doing the man's work uh, reiterates the fact that he's very vulnerable in this setting he saw all spoiled. Don't let him cut my hand off, the doctor. When he comes, don't let him, sister. So look at, I've just put dialogue here because I think it's interesting that he's finally given a voice which suggests that Frost feels like his experience at this point is important and should be shared. And what do we see with that experience? We see imperatives. Um, so there's um, an eagerness, an urgency uh, about, about this boy at this point. There's definitely a desperation. Look at the exclamation mark. Um, and then there's lots to say here, but I felt like it's, this is a good opportunity to focus on the punctuation. So, but the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ever. He lay and puffed his lips out with his breath. And then the watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little, less, nothing. And that ended it. Look at the caesuras and the end stop lines. There's a great sense of finality and there's a real bluntness again in this tone. The language is still very, very simple. It's not talking about him struggling to breathe. It just says that he puffed his lips out with his breath. Um, and then little less no nothing. So blunt, it seems so harsh the way that it's his um, life ending is described. Um, so the diction and the dashes mirror the quickness of his life leaving. So I feel like these visually also represent his heart stopping. Um, and the exclamation mark here brings that shock and that horror of how quickly his life ended. Um, and then look at the simple language and again the monosyllables. This blunt tone again towards the end and this sense of heartlessness with what we see. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, since they were not the the one dead, turned to their affairs. So there's something really heartless about this. But I don't think Frost is trying to depict the people around him in a in a in an individually negative way. I think he's trying to emphasise the harshness of life, the life that they live as well. Maybe they can't afford to mourn. Um, they can't afford the luxury of having a day off and being upset about it. They must just carry on. It could be that. Or is this so common that they've become desensitised to it? So there's a number of ways to look at that. But I think it's more of a general comment on the harshness of this life than it is about the individual people moving on so quickly. Um, okay, so um, I feel like we kind of, we talked quite a bit about structure and how it changes so I haven't put too much here but one it's it's one long it's one stanza so you might argue that this represents life and how fleeting it is and how quickly it can change it represents the boy's life the shortness of his life it's free verse so there's a um, again you could you could link that to the unpredictability of life but also note that the the descriptive style of language at the beginning and how that changes to simple language and so I would argue that the descriptive language draws our attention to the buzzsaw and foreshadows um, this kind of death lurking uh, in the background. 
Um, but then the simple language to describe the setting and and the way um, the the kind of content of his life, if you like, represents the the simpleness of it. Um, the the traditional life that he leads, and then at the end, I'd say the simple language really kind of represents the harshness of that life. This blunt realization that life um, can seem so meaningless. Just going back as well, sorry, I should have mentioned the shock of this, the fact that they do turn to their affairs, links back to um, the allusion to Macbeth. Is this the point where we start questioning what was the point in this poor boy's life? Everyone moved on. Um, he seems now so insignificant. Um, and so this kind of encourages us to reflect on the insignificance of the individual. It's a really h- harsh... Um, dark poem that I don't like thinking about too much actually it makes me go a little bit weird um and maybe you're the same but it's the way Robert Frost I guess is handling the, the way that this story affected him and that's everything remember uh, feel free to comment on your ideas I do love I don't always respond but I do love reading people's different interpretations and I often mention them with my own students so thank you for that <laughs>